you've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Imaging Services, Posture Screen, Mahalo Wellness, Cairo Moguls, Fit to Lift, Five Star Management, Rhino Coaching, Cairo Health USA, Local Gold, The Goodman Factor, McCaffrey Clinical Mentoring, Go Get Talks, Cairo Thin, Unmarket Your Practice, and Free My Pain Now with Dr. Matt DeDuro. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 132 of Cairo Hustle. I'm your co-host Luke Millette, and here's your host, Jim Chester. So today we had the opportunity of interviewing Keith Wasung, and if you want to hear from the original chiropractic advocate, stay tuned. Hey guys, so today is episode 132 of the Cairo Hustle podcast, and today we have the uh, legendary Keith Wasung with us. Um, You're actually uh, an honorary doctor, right? Um, It's an honorary of chiropractic humanities, so it's really not an honorary chiropractor, it's chiropractic humanities, which I think is the only one in the world that I know of. Yeah, it's pretty stellar. When I first heard that about you, I was like, man, this guy's a cut above everybody else that does chiropractic marketing. And uh, first time I met you, uh, we were actually in uh, Davenport, Iowa, I believe, at a, uh, an ICA convention, and you were there speaking with Dan Sullivan. So yeah, it was, it's was. it been a few years, but uh, that was an yeah. awesome time. Yeah. So let's just jump right into this episode. And uh, I know you've been doing chiropractic speaking engagements and chiropractic marketing for a long time. What, what actually was like the first thing that really attracted you to the chiropractic profession? Well, I, I, I kind of have to tell you my story a little bit because my own story is what attracted me, but my own story isn't what, what sustained me. Other people's stories have sustained me. It's, it's been about 34 years now. Um, I was a young uh, 20-something uh, sailor living in Charleston, South Carolina, a part of the Nuclear Submarine Service, which, by the way, I got a shout-out, 50th anniversary of the launch. I was in kindergarten when we saw it, and I'm about an hour from where it was actually launched down, down here, so it's just a tremendous, tremendous day. Um, but there I was. I was also, that year, won the Navy and Armed Forces Heavyweight Weightlifting Championship, and that became my job, special services, to travel and tour and train which is, uh, in, in that field, you don't need to train a whole lot. So I had a lot of free time. I was going to college full-time. I had a full-time job outside working at health clubs and things like that. Uh, life was good. I was on covers of magazines. I was the national champion at the time. I held most of the drug-free records. Someone visually, in a long, long time back then, I, I was a picture of health back then. Very lean, 7 8% body fat, you know, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Came back from a tour in California in early 1986, and I started developing some sinus issues, sinus headaches, no big deal. Go down to the Navy dispensary, get two or three drugs, cleared right up. But the next day I had really, really bad diarrhea. In fact, we called it nuclear diarrhea. I go back to the hot to the dispensary and they said, well, that's expected. Here's something for the diarrhea. Two days later, the diarrhea is gone and now I have uh, ringing in my ears. Give me a drug for that. That cleared up. Two days later, I had something else, something else, something else, something else. And they just kept chasing drugs, uh, symptoms with drugs. Within about three weeks, I'm taking 18 different kinds of medication, taking about 70 pills a day. And I remember sitting in my, in my living room with some friends watching a football game, and I was just real foggy. And a roommate looked over at me, and he said, are, are you okay? And I said, yeah, why? He goes, yeah, I, you're, you're not okay. I'm taking you to the hospital. Normally, that would be like, what for? We're in the middle of a football game here. I said, okay. Like, I knew something was wrong. They, he drove me as fast as possible to the, the Navy hospital, and I collapsed as they, as they brought me in. And I spent the next eight days in the basically the ER being poked and prodded. They injected something in the back of my, my head. I lost 90% of the hearing in this ear, all my hair, neither of which it returned. And they finally sent me home. And I just got progressively worse and worse and worse. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, uh, couldn't keep anything down, threw up everything, got to where I was living on applesauce. And this went on for almost 14 months. And I went from this lean 215 pound athlete down to 165 pound shriveled mess. My skin was, was gray and ashy. I, I couldn't walk more than 10 or 15 steps just from sheer exhaustion. I couldn't sleep. And guys, I had access to some of the best doctors in the country. I, I saw President Reagan's private physician in Bethesda, Maryland. And, and they were well-intentioned. They, they, they doing what they could, but they continued to chase symptoms with drugs. And I spent, again, about 14 months just, just being a zombie. And uh, I remember the last six or seven months sleeping in my bathroom at night 
because they gave me a medication that gave me the, the dry heaves, nausea. And I would have dry heaves for three, four, five hours at a time, three, four minutes apart. And finally, the, the, I met with the medical team, again, good people. I still am in touch with some of them today. And they said, Keith, your, your immune system's failing. You're, you're, you're going to die. We don't know when, but you're not going to make it to the end of the year. And this would have been 1987, early 87, get your affairs in order. And so I wasn't married, I didn't have kids. And I took care of some things legally. I didn't have a whole lot left. Everything had been depleted. And I had a friend drive me to a shopping mall to buy Christmas gifts for my family, knowing I wasn't going to be alive six, seven, eight months later. And I spent the entire day buying gifts, really only four or five things, but I would buy a gift, go sit in the food court for like an hour to recover. Um, on the last trip, I was in a bookstore, and a guy behind me sees me, says, hey, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I got my book, went out to the mall waiting for my ride to show up, and he followed me. And he said, hey, what's, what's wrong with you? And I, I was tired. You get tired of telling your story. People in Charleston knew who I was from the lifting. I was kind of a minor celebrity, and I was on TV and radio. People knew who I was. And they would see me, and it was like, well, what's wrong with him? And the rumors fly. Well, he's got steroid withdrawal, which is ridiculous. He's got AIDS. That was, that was prominent then. He's got cancer. He's got this. He's got that. And you really get tired of just telling your story. But this guy persisted, and I had nothing better to do. So I told him the story. He said, you should come see me. I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> I laughed for the first time, probably the first laughter out of my mouth in over a year. As you understand, I got internal issues. My immune system's failing. Nothing wrong with the back, nothing wrong with the neck. It's the only thing where my, my body doesn't hurt. He said, Keith, there's more to chiropractic than, than what you think. Now, he was like two or three weeks into practice, right out of school, hunting patients at the bookstore. That's what he was doing. And, and I finally lied to him and said, yeah, I'll, I'll come see you just to get rid of him. I, I really had no interest I grew up with a father who was negative about chiropractic, with a mother that was semi-negative. It's just, just how we grew up. And um, as I'm leaving, my friend who had showed up to give me a ride, because I couldn't drive, he'd overheard the conversation. And on the way home, he said, um, you want me to give you a lift tomorrow to that guy's office? And I said, I'm not going. In. He's a chiropractor. He goes, yeah, so? And I said, do you, do you know anything about chiropractic? He goes, nothing good. He goes, but if it was me and I was in the year position, Diane, he goes, I, I'd, I'd go to a witch doctor. I'd go, to, I'd go see a guy practicing. What, what else are you doing tomorrow besides throwing up? And I would literally sit in my chair with a red bucket and throw up my applesauce. And I said, okay, worth a shot. I was stranger things have happened. It takes me in the next day. And uh, boy, this guy just talked my head. Out. He still talks to this day. And uh, it was like a one-hour consultation and then a one-hour exam. And then he, he adjusted me. And then he rested me. And I felt no different. And then he hugged me, which was really weird. He says, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm like, yeah, you'll never see me again. <laughs> and I'll, no, I'm mad. I'm, I'm really mad because, like, I needed that. So I'm driving home. I'm giving my friend the devil. Oh, thanks, buddy. Thanks a lot. Could you just walk away? Go home, eat my applesauce, and I go to bed for another, you know, night's trying to sleep. And I woke up the next day, and I wasn't in pain, Jim Luke. I wasn't in pain, but I was stiff and sore, head to toe. Like, when you, when you do two-a-day football the first time, you put the pads on, or you do a new workout, you're just like, and I remember thinking, that's, that's what these guys do. That's what these chiropractors, these quacks do. They hurt you one day, and the next day they fix you. Dad was right, and I, I was mad. And I go take a shower, I get dressed, and I walk into the kitchen to, to eat my applesauce, which I was living on, and I've, it's, it's been a long time, and I've never forgotten that feeling of standing in the middle of the floor, barefoot, on tile, and three things just hit me. I had just slept, slept eight straight hours for the first time in a year and a half. I had just taken a shower, put on my clothes, and brushed my teeth, and I wasn't wiped out. Normally, I would have to go sit in a chair for an hour to recover from the agony of taking a shower and getting dressed. That's how weak I was. And I was hungry for the first time in over a year. And I had tried to eat other foods, and I, I, they, just, they just came right back up. Something in applesauce, you know, keep, keeps it settled. And I went in, and I soft-boiled a, a few eggs, figured, well, I, I know I'm going to throw up, but at least soft-boiled eggs are easy coming up. I, soft boiled two eggs and I ate them and I, and I grabbed this red bucket and I sat in a chair just waiting to throw up and it didn't happen. And I went, huh, huh. Well, you know, uh, maybe there's something to this. So I went back and I let him adjust me again and again and again. And it wasn't like all of a sudden the, the heavens parted and, you know, the hand of God came down and I'm, I'm healed. But every day got better. My activities of daily living got better. And I'll say this chiropractic is more about sustaining and maintaining ADLs than any other thing. So I wasn't in, I, w I was asymptomatic. I was just weak. 
and my energy was restoring. I was more, I could, I could walk. I could go out to the mailbox and get my mail. I could do things. Baby steps. Within three or four weeks, I, I, I got rid of the medication on my own. Wasn't told to do that. Within five weeks, I put my uniform back on. I put about 20 pounds on. I'm eating rice. I'm eating sliced tomatoes. My digestive system was a mess. I show up for work at the Navy office, group six in Charleston, reporting for duty. They thought they were coming to my funeral. Within six weeks, I'm back in the gym training, little pink weights, you know, trying to train. Within 10 months, I'm competing again on the international stage, going from nationally ranked to world-class ranked. And that was my experience. Now, understand something. He tried to explain it to me. I was curious, and it made sense. There's a reason most chiropractic stuff goes right over the head. And I'm bringing people to him. I'm bringing people him. I brought my commanding officer's wife. I used to sit in church and people would have prayer requests on health items. I'd write their names. I'd go pick them up at their house and take them. So I probably referred him 25, 30 people inside of about six weeks. I was like a Jim Chester back then, just bringing people in. And all of them improved to one degree or another their ADLs. Next door neighbor of mine had, had early polio. Her, her ADLs improved, which is what it's all about. And I, I read the brochures in the office. I read some of the books in his office. Now, I'm from Nebraska. I'm a little slow, but it just, it just wasn't registering. And I'm bringing more and more people, people that I used to work with at the gym, old friends, you know, as you start living life again. And um, I spent really, I mean, go to the, we didn't have Google, didn't have the internet. We had microfish. And I'd go down, I'd pull up microfish and nothing. And I finally started going down to the medical library in Charleston, great, great university teaching hospital, and reading physiology books. And I would stay there till midnight till they closed, like four in the afternoon till midnight, just reading, studying neuroanatomy. And it wasn't until I got a hold of some green books on this doctor's shelf, which he had for wall decoration. He had never read them. And in the green books, I saw the, the philosophy, the why, why the body works, the why everybody always, buddies, always works the way it does. In the physiology, the medical books, it was the how, the physiology, how the body works and how the body out works. When I put them together, it hit me. And it, it took me months to figure this out. And I went, wow, how did I miss this? How did I spend? How is it I almost have a master's degree and I've never heard the term subluxation? How come none of my coaches told me? How come none of the people who trained me in lifting and football and wrestling? How is it that, how is it that I grew up in all this and I never put this together? And I just, I just made a vow. I said, you know what? Um, I will never be responsible for someone else that I come across not at least knowing this. Now, if I tell it to them and they don't act on it, I'm off the hook. And that's all I've really done the last 32, going on 33 years is go out, lecture. I'm really, I, I sometimes get labels of marketing guy and I'm really not. My, or even, he's a guy that helps chiropractors. If it happens, it happens. My purpose is to go out and engage the public. And for the next 20 years, I averaged about 300 public lectures every year. Uh, just going out anywhere and everywhere, starting off in my neighborhood and then really around the world. I'm probably a third of that now, probably closer to 100, 120. Most of them are, are, are medical schools, medical conferences. I do some CE stuff around the country for chiropractors. Uh, but all I've ever done is try to go out and engage the raw public who has no knowledge, or maybe they even have an abnormal knowledge of what chiropractic is. And so um, my story wouldn't have sustained me. I would have, I would have forgotten about it long before now. But I've just, I've seen too much. I've been exposed to too much. Now I'm seeing, I'm seeing grandkids of the people that I referred 30 years ago and, and people will come up to me in airports. Hey, you know what? I, grown men with, 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 with little kids. I was five years old. And my mama took me in because you, you know, this and that. That's what sustains me. The, the, everyone. How could I walk away? Trust me, I've tried. I've tried to walk away. I've tried to quit. I've seen too much. So now that you're in the chiropractic space, other than speaking engagements, what other kind of things are you doing in the, in the chiropractic space? What are some things you're doing that are unique? I really speaking and talking to people and sometimes it's a formal speaking type thing where it's actually a lecture or a series of lectures. Other times it's a meeting with middle management, like a corporation where they want to incorporate occupational health and safety. Um, sometimes I've, I, you know, I, I get into the, 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 the dental space a little bit where they want to know more about this and their frustration, believe it or not, is Keith, you're talking neurological subluxation here, which makes sense. And yet every chiropractor in my neighborhood is talking back pain, neck pain, and other stuff. What's, where's, where's the disconnect here? So that, that's the challenge. Because I, I don't know that the, the public is hungry and craving back pain relief. Because God knows they got a whole medicine cabinet full of it. It's not hard to get rid of back pain. 
or neck pain or anything like that. It's not hard to alleviate that. They are looking for improved ADLs, health for kids. They know there's a problem with their kids' immune health, which I'm a big immune system guy. When I started writing and producing literature, a lot of it was immune system. And so that's, that's all I've ever done. And I've had, look, I've had chances along the way to do things and come over here and do this and be that. And I've just never, people ask me, why aren't you a chiropractor? And I go, number one, my, I have the clumsiest hands you've ever seen. And number two, I, I just, I've never had the call. And I don't see myself doing anything other than what I'm doing uh, until the day I take my last breath. Well, Keith, it's very rare that I do one of these interviews and I actually cry, but your story is so like heartfelt to me. And when you actually go out there and you change people's lives by telling the story, you know, that's what I heard early on as I started out with my advocacy and, you know, towing the line with society. Um, I was always told, just tell people that story. And that's what I find that, you know, after me, I'm almost a decade now in the chiropractic profession. And, you know, as I hear your, you know, where you've come from, it's very touching to me because there are so many people that don't believe. And I tell the people that, you know, you can believe it or not, but it works every time. And I mm -hmm. tell them, you know, Santa Claus and Easter Bunny are belief system. Chiropractic mm -hmm. is a health art. And yeah. I was like, if you wanted to come in and see if we could help you, there's a reason that you're in front of me today talking to me. It's not mm -hmm. because you like our sign. It's because yeah. you're looking for an answer for what's going on with you. Sure. And you don't have to like me at all, but you can go see this doc that can change your life. If you Absolutely. just give me the chance to schedule you in, we can change your life. So when I hear what your friend did for you and how desperate this chiropractor must have been to go to a bookstore looking for new patients, like he would, Jim, he would hang out by the health section casually. Like he was reading a book. And if somebody came up in the health section, which was mostly nutrition, he would pounce on them. Or he'd put his, his business cards in the book so when they open up, they, they would drop out. That's, that's what he was doing. Well, you know, when, when it comes to like growing a practice, um, there's no right way to do it. So yeah. that guy was out there. Who was it, by the way? I gotta say. <laughs> he knows who he is. <laughs> what city? I'm Charleston, South Carolina. South Carolina. Cool, cool. Well, as we uh, move into this interview um, with you, I know you do a lot of patient ed. Mm -hmm. um, Talk to us a little bit about the patient ed that you created and how you started filling, uh, uh, basically creating information for docs to educate their patient base with. Sure. I would, when, when I was doing all my library research, I was blown away by the data outside of chiropractic. And I'll still say the best data that supports the, 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 the subluxation principle comes from outside the profession. It's sort of inadvertent accidentally. Uh, they, they, they didn't mean to validate spinal nerve interference, but they are. So I found all this stuff, and this is back when, you know, immune system spine wasn't even on the radar. It was just starting to. I'm finding all this neat stuff, so I'm, I'm, bringing, I'm talking about it in my lecture, and I'm talking about the research. Now, this is, I'm using whiteboards back then. We didn't have PowerPoint. You, you, you know, sometimes you'd have the old slide, not the, not the slide projector, the, uh, the overhead. And I had all these plastic images. I, I had like 600 of them, and they would all fall apart, and they'd stick together. And, but I would, I would show from a magazine, this is where it was, it's from a journal, this is, this is this data. And so people would say, can I get a copy of that? I'd say, absolutely. Um, give me your address and I'll mail it to you. Can I get a copy? I'd love a copy of that. Again, I wanted to have the data to present because I had no credibility. I'm just, I'm just a kid from Nebraska. I don't, I'm not a doctor, I'm not even close. But, the, but it wasn't about me and my knowledge, it was I was simply bringing it to the, the forefront. And so I got to where I'm mailing out, you know, 2,000 envelopes a month. I went, I, I can't afford this. It's already, I'm already having to fund this myself. And so I started putting these packages together and like, like synopsis and you know, like, here, here's a little quote, here's the reference. And I have like maybe six or seven sheets of paper that I handed out at the end. And that's sort of where the workshop feedback sheet came in, where I didn't want a lecture where people go, well, that was great information. Now what, what, what over here? I wanted to teach them and then send them home with stuff to read. I, you, know, you think about the best teachers, like when you're in high school, they weren't the ones that were great at giving you information. They're the ones that got you excited, interested, and then they point in the right directions. And then go, go study on your own. That's, that's all I've ever tried to do. So I'm, I'm putting all these packets together just as handouts. And by 1990, 91, it's been two, three years, 
I'm getting calls from chiropractors. Hey, I, some patient I brought in this really great packet. This is all black and white, by the way. And I'm, I'm illustrating them too. I'm, I'm doing cut and paste. I'm making copies. But they were really crude. Can, can, we, can we use this in our office? Can we buy it from you? I go, no, you can buy it from me. Just, just use it. Well, I'm getting more and more and more calls. Uh, chiropractors going, is this, data, is, this, is this legitimate? Is this real? I go, absolutely. I mean, the reference is right there. And again, this wasn't where you could Google it and check it. And by 91, people are saying, Keith, you got, you got to start you know, selling this stuff. And initially, I started pre creating like brochures, just print brochures. Um, couldn't keep them updated. Uh, tech, you know, information was coming so fast. So I started creating content to where people would buy one packet from me. Again, a print copy. And then you can make as many copies as you want. Here's just the, the you buy the packet and then you can make copies. That saves me from having to mail you copies all the time. And one thing led to another, and you know, the digital age came along, which changed everything. And I began colorizing and digitizing. And we're right now we have over a thousand pieces that we offer in the in the in the package that um, chiropractors can have access to. And we we send these out to other places as well. And I probably got another two thousand of things in my in my library, in my arsenal that that people who, who get the packet from me had access to. And um, so, again, I never set out going, huh, I wonder what these docs would buy from me. Because I get people that call me all the time and go, you know what, if you'll create this, 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 and this, I'll, I'll buy it. And I go, it's not something I would use. Not, not that it's bad, I'm just not interested. And so I continue to create content for the public that the public's interested in. Uh, right now, I'm spending a lot of time on the mental health. My, my oldest daughter is a uh, nurse practitioner in psychiatric health. She and I are co-authoring some papers. Uh, boy, that, that field used to be like chiropractic, forget it. And I tell you, I'm getting more and more invites. They're starting to see the relationship between, you know, the brain stem and the, and the hypothalamus and all this kind of stuff. So I just continue to create content that I use for myself. And the doctors that know about me buy it for me. I don't market a whole lot. It sells extremely well. And, and again, the guys, guys, gals like the fact they only have to buy it once. And, and by the way, we update it every year. So People that bought from me 20 years ago, they get a new updated set. Their content's always fresh just for that one-time fee. That's awesome. So what are some of your favorite motivational quotes or mantras that keep you fired up every day? You know, Luke, I, I am absolutely unaffected by <laughs> motivational quotes. It's just not me. When I was a district manager with the Royal Bank of Canada in the investment division, and I ran an investment team of about 15 guys, and my boss would say to me, Keith, you got to motivate these guys. You got to kind of get them, you got to call them up in the morning and, and read a motivational poem, show them a motivational video. And I would go, Rick, look, these guys, they all have little kids at home. Okay. If that doesn't motivate them to get out and do their jobs and earn a living, I got nothing. What's a poem going to do? Um, and, and if some people need that, that's great. But I'll, I'll tell you what keeps me on track because, you know, when we we're kids, we we're playing sports. We're told by our dads and our coaches and our moms, nothing worse than a quitter. There's nothing worse than quitting. I disagree with that. There's a lot of things worse than quitting. There's hanging around and doing a half-assed job. And I swore I would never, if it got to a point where I was just complacent about this or whatever, I was, I, I'd rather quit and move on and find something else. But it's easy to do. BJ Palmer slipping and checking. So at least twice a year, sometimes three times, I got one coming up next month. Between six o'clock and nine o'clock, I go find a local hospital, different one every time, or at least a, I rotate during visiting hours, and I simply walk the hallways very slowly. I'm not there to judge the hospital, the medical system, the doctors and nurses and, and workers. They're doing the absolute best job they can, but I'm there to immerse myself in the lives of people that have been part of a failed model of healthcare based on feelings, symptoms, and drugs, and not functionality and ADLs. I just look at people, walk past them, look at that guy, look at that guy. Yeah, we see the, the family out in the lobby, they're, they're praying, their hands are circled, the pastor's with them. I just go, man, did, did that guy cross my path five years earlier? Because I know if I could have talked to him and we could have connected, he'd have been on a different path. What about this guy? You know, he's, he's, he's 61 years old, that's not much older than me. And he's about ready to retire. He's, he's got a million dollars in his 401k. And he and his wife, they bought this camper, and they're going to coach their little league kids for their grandkids. And they're going to sit. This is what they worked for. And came in the hospital a couple days ago and not coming out. If I really need a chicken in the ass, I go up and I, I look at the, the babies. The, the babies are. And there's always one or two in the back and then in, in that incubator. And I just, I just breathe it in. I, I smell the air. I, just, I immerse myself in the, 
in stage, again, not judging their intentions or doing what they can. And I walk out and I sit in my car and reflect for a little bit and I go, time to get to work, time to, time to get to work. Not that I'm opposed to that, not that I'm anti that, there's a better way. And at least I have part of the, the knowledge that can lead people down a better path. That's, that's what keeps me on track. It doesn't motivate me, but it keeps me from getting complacent and not caring. Because let me tell you, you immerse yourself in this profession, you, you can get burned out and complacent and wonder, am I the only one here really quickly? So that's it. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Imaging Services, Posture Screen, Mahalo Wellness, Cairo Moguls, Fit to Lift, Five Star Management, Rhino Coaching, Cairo Health USA, Local Gold, The Goodman Factor, McCaffrey Clinical Mentoring, Go Get Talks, Cairo Thin, Unmarket Your Practice, and Free My Pain Now with Dr. Matt DeDuro. Let's hustle. I don't know how many people know this, but I was one of the incubator babies. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So how would the world change if everyone got under consistent chiropractic care? <laughs> I tried to go there. Um, well, we'd have to find another industry uh, that would take the place of healthcare as a multi-trillion dollar industry. But I'm sure we'd find it. Uh, I think people would be far more productive. I think we'd live longer. I think Social Security would start at about age 80. Um, I think doctors, medical doctors and nurses would be able to do their jobs a whole lot better. They'd be almost like the doctors of the 50s and the 60s, the Doc Hollywoods. They're there to, to overcome limitation of matter. You know, if you think about it, you know, what, what, when you break an arm or, or something, you set the bone, put a cast on it, you're there to overcome a limitation of matter, put the body back in a position where it can best heal itself. That's, that's chiropractic philosophy. The, you wouldn't be drug heavy. There'd still be drugs, and drugs are necessary. They, they certainly serve a purpose. They save lives, and they work well in certain situations. Um, it would be a different world, to say the least. I, I think we would – I don't know that we'd get rid of mental health because I think there's other factors that go into it, just, just the public and the culture. But I think it would go I, – I can't think of anything that would more dramatically improve this world than the vision you just laid out. You know, I, I – Love these types of questions, especially fielded by you, because I see a lot of myself in you from what the work that we're doing as a team, Luke and I, mm -hmm. and what we've done with our documentaries and the podcast and scheduling all these people in. I see a lot of symbiosis between you and I. Yeah. And uh, when I first met you, I was just so, I, I felt like I'd met like a, a rock star, man. And I, you know, you probably are, you know, it deflects off of you, but what you mean to this profession is something profound. And uh, it's, it's been really cool to see how we've like uh, circled around each other and supporting mm -hmm. each other. And when any time I post anything about chiropractic, like voice, like sharing the voice, you say, hey, Jim, anything I can do to help? Uh, any, anytime that I can jump on, let's just do it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I sent it to you. And before, before the ink was even dry, you were scheduling the interview with us. And, that's what I, I love. Tell you why, I tell you why I did it because I get I get asked to do a lot of these and I turn most of them down when I just don't have the time. Um, I know you both have, and I use the term, chewed a lot of dirt. You know what I'm saying? You've been in the trenches long before you got well known, and I think we have a lot of people, and not just in chiropractic, who are trying to almost become Kardashians. They want to be famous for being famous and not really have a whole lot of, uh, of, of, of doing, of actually doing anything. And you both have, have been in the trenches chewing dirt for a long time, um, as have I. And I feel like I'm just getting started, so. Hell yeah. I feel like I'm just getting started, too. So our next question is basically a, a underhand, slow-pitch softball to you. Um, where do you see the profession going in 20 years? Not to get off on a tangent, I, I'm probably more concerned about where our culture is going in 20 years because that's going to affect the chiropractic aspect. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's like the Wild West out there globally, so I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned. I, I have a strong glimmer of hope in that I've seen a 
growing number of, of young men and young women in the last five to seven years graduating and doing it right. Building their practice before they ever even graduate, getting it all set up, treating it like a business first and not a Peace Corps crusader, I'm gonna save the world. You know what, if you can't make a living at this, you can't help a whole lot of people. You, you just can't. If you can't make a living correctly and stay out of debt eventually, you're, you're, you're gonna be a slave to a, a third party or someone you're pulling shots. Um, so I've seen a lot of young people, young docs that are doing it right, building it right, not trying to become famous, but they come, become well known as a result of their actions make a difference in their community and docs all the time, young docs. Well, what can I do? What can I do? What do you do? Make a difference in your community, succeed clinically and financially clinically take care of their subluxations, teach them correctly, collect the money from it for the most part and, and breathe, breathe your own oxygen. Uh, you do that. Other stuff will show up. Um, guys, I know I, I've watched guys that I know that were good doctors that somehow saw their buddy across town become, I call them stage famous. And they just had to have it. They had to, like, like, like building a great practice, having a great income, being with their family, and making a difference in the lives of three, 400 families, like it's not enough. They have to be a Kardashian. And it, it killed them. It, it kills them. Literally. And I've seen them 30 years later, they're still trying to find that, you know, I, I, it's an ego thing. Maybe it's an insecure thing. I, I don't know. Um, so I do see a young crop of these, these people doing it right. They're involved in research. They're publishing. They're publishing case studies. They're, they're, we've, we've got to get more of them into the, the board political aspect of our profession. And I tell them, don't do it right away. You don't, you know, build your practice first. Um, we definitely have to take care of some of that, that at the state board level, getting the right people on. Uh, I'm, I'm in, been nominated by the, the governor of Florida, not by the governor, by I'm in line to be on the board for, for Florida. And uh, so we're waiting to hear from that anytime. And uh, I'm going to do everything I can to, to shake things up because the, the really good people are busy. They don't have time for a lot of that. So we need more people like that. So, um, you know, if, if, if we had a 1% shot at making it, 1% of being better 20 years from now than we're now, I'll take those odds. I think, I think it's better than 1%. It's worth it for me. Just the potential. It's worth it for me. One in a million. So do you have a favorite app or technology to stay engaged with your audience? Email. Email. It's not an app. Yeah. That's still the best way to communicate, still the best way to connect. Uh, I send out regular information to people around the world that are in academic and kind of non, you know, people think tanks and things like that. And I come out with new stuff. I can click a button and it's there in, in just seconds. And I, I couldn't do that with any other thing I could think of. So email. Yeah, you know, I think that there's a lot to, to go back into when it comes to email communication mm -hmm. because that's how you really nurture your audience. Yeah. And that's consistent. If you send out value to people, um, people want more of what you do. Mm -hmm. The more that you share value to them, the more that they feel connected to you. And you yeah. might not talk to somebody, Keith, in an entire year, but they'll come up to you and they'll be like, man, those emails that you send me are really helpful. Correct. And I'll give you an example. And, and this is kind of how I think chiropractors should market. You, you both follow me on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Fair to say I post a lot. Yeah. Have you ever seen me post a promo to buy my stuff or a link or a price or get, have you ever seen me do that? No. It's content, content, content. And I, I, I got a following. I mean, I, I'm, I got 900 pending requests right now for friends. So I, I, I have that following because it's not viewed as another guy trying to sell something, another guy trying to, uh, I'd say something that blows my mind is how many people will call me when they say, hey, Mr. to get your pack of materials, it's this, it's that. And, and we start talking, they're not chiropractor. They're, they're like some patient who's trying to solve their own family's health issues, willing to spend hundreds of dollars. And I go, that blows me away. So they're looking, they're, they're absolutely looking. But I believe chiropractors should do the same thing content, content, consistent content. And it's the type of where you create such a compelling message that people just naturally want to follow you. You know, I, I do these lectures and, and I have a lot of people when I do these lectures in the public that, that want to become patients. I don't, I don't offer them a deal. I don't do this fancy clothes. If I got a deal for you, it's 29 a day. They just naturally, they, they, they wouldn't let me leave the room without it. And that's a, that's a, to me, a, a better long-term thing than trying to close the deal with a snappy offer that expires tomorrow at four o'clock. <laughs>
Yeah, that's, I do the same thing with when, when I was doing investments full time, which I still dabble in it, you know, just ask the right questions, lead the people right to where you want them to go for their own best interest. You can get just about anybody to do anything if you lead them to believe it was their own ideal all along, because it really is. As opposed to, you know, overcoming objections and, you know, the, the, the traditional sales cycle, which may have worked at one time, but I, but I, th- I find it annoying. I think most people do. Yeah, I think that the the way that they've trained the up and coming marketers is to always create that urgency and to create the scarcity and to create that uh, limited time offer. We only have six slots available till tomorrow at four. I'm not saying that doesn't work, Jim. I just know when I sit in an audience and I got 50 people, I know that a certain number, I, I, mean, I could offer them to join a, a religious cult and they would, they would join just... I'm thinking more about the person that's not going to come in today, but's going to go home and stew on it, ponder it. There's more of them than there are today. I want to make sure I don't alienate them. And I've seen a lot of docs do lectures, and they do a, they do a great presentation, and then they do that, that hardcore close, and they get five or six new patients, and they go, ah, look at me. But they alienate those other 45 and went, jeez. You know, and so I, I'm always playing the long game. And I know you both do too. It's, it's, it's more of a long game. The, the ones ready to go now, they're going to come anyway. You know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't prevent them if I wanted to. I want to think long term and get the, the, the early ones, the ones that, are, that need some time. And then those that maybe will never come in, but they'll refer someone in. And then the guys in the back that will never come in, but I at least neutralize them. They're, the, they're like my dad, you know. I, I could never convince them, but I could neutralize them. So... So tell us a little bit about uh, your personal life. Are you in the middle of any good books? What podcasts do you like? And what are your hobbies? Uh, well, I, I have six kids and we homeschool. Okay. <laughs> My wife no just hobbies. went back to school. Her dream was to always to be a, a emergency room surgical nurse. And so she just started school. She's actually going to college with one of my daughters here in, in Orlando. And she says, I just want to work part time because the kids are going to be out of the house in a couple of years. And I just want to go, you know, work at the ER a couple hours or a couple, couple days a week. And I went, great. So there's not a lot of time on, in, 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 in my life. I'm very involved in my, my kids' lives. My children have just all incredibly successful. And they come to me and my wife both for, for advice and career advice. And, you know, um, it, it blows me. Even, even, the, even the youngest ones, my, my youngest daughter, the twins, top gymnast in the country. Her brother is, he just turned 15 and he's building websites and robots in his spare time for, for, for companies. That's what he does. And um, so I'm very involved in their lives. Hobbies. I love football. I love watching it. I love fantasy football. We have a big league with just family and extended friends. So that's a lot of fun. Um, other than that, I, I still like working out. We work out in the mornings, three, four mornings a week. I don't like it as much as I used to. <laughs> it's more of a, more of a chore now than it was. Um, I love my work and so my work becomes my hobby. I, I don't ever see myself building model airplanes or playing golf or doing something like that. It just, it just bore me to tears. Um, that's it. What books do you like? Um, I don't read, I don't recreation read as much as I'd like to. I just started reading the Harry Potter series because I've got all my nieces and nephews that are around here. They're all like 10, 11, 12, 13, and they're all just insanely here. In fact, my whole family is at Universal at Hogsmeade right now. My eight-year-old nephew is visiting for the week. He loves Harry Potter. So he's, um, he's there right now doing spells and things like that. And so I'm reading the books just to have conversations with them. That's um, cool. But in terms of most of my reading, it's, it's going to be uh, – Medical, like medical, medical research, you know, research. I, I, I subscribe to a ton of, of research and, I, and I'm reading them, and I'm scouring them, and I'm trying to find stuff uh, as well as the green books. And I love reading, uh, I love reading autobiographies uh, of, of, of famous people. That, that to me is, it's more inspirational and motivational because I'm looking for ideas there more than I'm looking for a, you know, a pick me up. Um, I think if I had more time in my life and I think when Peggy, when the kids are off to college and Peggy's working and I can maybe back off a little bit, I think I'll spend my, my spare days going to the library, going to the bookstore, and just picking up a few, three or four random books off the shelf and just reading to my heart's content because I love doing that. And I don't have a lot of time to do it. So let me ask you a question we never asked anybody. Who, what's your favorite band? Music taste. 
All time? Yeah. Um, Meatloaf with songs by Jim Steinman. And Jim Steinman had an album called Bad for Good that I, 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 I wore out like six cassettes listening to it. I'm just enthralled with, with Meatloaf, the, just that raw emotion. Uh, I loved his backup singers. Uh, I, I even like, like I said, Jim Steinman wasn't as good of a singer as Meatloaf was, but I just, I, I love that. Um, I've always liked Cheap Trick. I think they have a similar kind of uh, music. Uh, huge Neil Diamond fan. Uh, first concert I ever saw in my life, I was 15, was Elton John in Lincoln. And I just saw him on my farewell tour, however many years, 50, well, not 50, 40 years later. Um, but but it, would, it would be Meatloaf pretty much hands down. That's awesome. And so. Yeah, thanks. I love Meatloaf. And there's, there's a guy called, um, he's, a, he's, he's, he's from Egypt, but he grew up in Greece. And I'm drawing a blank in his name. I'll think of it and have to miss you. Just the most incredible. You know, I never heard of the guy. Just randomly heard him one day and went, wow, how, how did I miss this guy? It's kind of like chiropractic. You, you know, the great thing about chiropractic is when I said, how do I, how did I miss this? Since then, it changed me as a person because now if someone goes up and says, you know what? I was abducted by a UFO. I'll at least listen to him. I'll go, I, I, I'm open to new things. I'll at least hear you out. Um, I may not believe it afterwards, but, but I no longer dismiss things that don't seem logical to me. So what are some websites that people can visit if they want to order some stuff for you or they want to learn more about you? Uh, KeithWasson.com, www.keithwasson.com. I'm having a new site built by, um, by Tristan. Um, and I'm way behind in giving him the content I need way behind. And if he's listening to this, Tristan, I'm so sorry. Um, so there's a lot, we really haven't updated it probably in a year and a half. Uh, but they can get, get with me, they can find basic stuff or they can just, Find me on Facebook. They can become friend 901. I'll send them, I'll send them you know, samples and things like that. They can look at it, read it, um, or just find any of the, the thousand doctors that have lifted some of my stuff and are sharing it, but it's outdated. And <laughs> so, Heg John says, uh, what are the green books you're currently reading? I'm actually reading Up From Below the Bottom, which was the first one I ever read. And I'm also reading Palmer's Law of Life again. And I'm reading that one. I don't, I don't have the guts to mark up uh, a green book with, with a pencil like I do most books. Every other book I've ever read, I mean, I mark it up. E even like Bibles and stuff like that, you know. I just don't have the heart because a lot of the books that I have are first edition. I have a pretty rare set. I really should buy a second set of reprints and use that to mark it. I have a lot of, of, of little yellow post-it notes and things like that, but I've, I've never written in a green book. Well, Heg also says Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell, was one of his first albums. Oh, yeah. Oh, we grew up on it. I mean, it just, it, it's great. I like him in the Iraqi Horror Picture Show. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, Meatloaf again. <laughs> well, this pretty much brings us to the end, of, the end of this interview. Is there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't ask you? You know, you asked me about a mantra, okay? Mm-hmm. This is what I, I'll, I'll say two things. Number one, it, well, I'll say one. Engage and then inform. We think, even though we're told, just tell the story, you know what? Before you can give information, that person has to be engaged in, in the realm. Um, and too many people try to start with the data. Whereas my, when I meet someone for the first time, even a group, I want to engage them first. So you do that by asking questions. You do that by getting them involved. You know what? I, I, Jed, Luke, I'd, I'd like, what do you think? Hey, let me get your opinion on something. And, I, and I'll throw something healthcare out and I get you talking and then I'll shift it over and we take it down the, the subluxation route. Um, so information is important, but not until you have that engagement. And you know what? You may not always have an engagement. I may be talking to someone and they're, they're over here, over here. You know, it's better to talk football now, weather now, and then we'll come back to it later than trying to force the issue. It's like meeting that person maybe an old friend or someone you haven't seen in a while and they're in this new thing, this new prepaid legal, and they can't wait to tell you all about it. And you're like, God. if they had brought it in slowly at the right time, then maybe you could have had a great conference. Other than that, forget it. That's, that's number one. Number two, I say to doctors, especially young doctors, they're just starting out. Getting everyone in the world under care is a great vision, 
but it's a stupid marketing strategy. <laughs> Nobody goes after 100%, okay? You're Noah, you built the ark, you control who comes in and it may not be everyone. Being exclusive in your own realm is a good thing. Fish with a narrow net, you'll get the kind of people you want and can serve. If not, you're gonna end up with a lot of smelly fish in the net. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. I tell people all the time that you have to attract the people that wanna see you burn and see you dance on fire. And not everybody wants to see you burn and dance on fire. Never there, there are people you couldn't pay them to come see you. I, I've been there, you know. Um, so, so why? It doesn't make them bad people. It doesn't make them stupid people. It doesn't make them whatever. They're just not part of what you got going on, which is very, very special. Keep it special. Make it exclusive. It's a relationship. Yep. Well, all right. That wraps up this episode of Cairo Hustle. Keith, thank you for being our guest today. Yeah. Sure. And Keith, I've got to go walk my three miniature wiener dogs now because they're, uh, they've been very good. They usually, like Oscar, my, my middle one, likes to get in on a podcast, but I locked the door, so he's scratching the door right now. <laughs> well, we'll let you get to your dogs, okay. but thanks for being our guest today. Okay. And we'll see you on the next one, okay? Okay, thanks. All right, bye, Keith. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.